Hello, I picked this um, scope up a week or two ago in a surplus sale. It, although the nameplate says it's a 544A, it's actually a 744A. Uh, these are pretty decent scopes, and even now they're still decent scope. They, this model came out in 1995 or so, and um, it was one of the first scopes that had InstaView, which is... Um, the nameplate should be more similar to this nameplate, the 754C, the top one. It actually has 500 megahertz bandwidth and 2.5 giga samples, unlike here where it says it's one giga sample or two giga. Yeah, two giga samples is what I should have said. So, um, Tech were the first to come out with this, and it was a pretty big deal at the time. And its main selling point was full feature scope plus it could um, detect fast glitches and it didn't need to know anything about the fast glitches all you needed to know is that there might be a glitch out there and it would do the rest if we can get this thing to power on this thing actually cost me 75 bucks um, no one could get it to turn on and that's because someone had left the cal switch in the back switched to the um, memory unprotected mode which won't allow these to boot up so that will do, all it would do is just sit there with all of the um, LEDs on and not show anything and you can see that it's a 744A it's got a math option oh, what was that, let me go back to that shift status, I think there'll be a banner here, yeah so I think the 13 is the color display, the 1F, I can't remember if that's a floppy drive or the, the math option, and then the 2F is either the floppy drive or the math option, or were they the communications, I just don't remember anymore, but anyway the 1M is the 1 meg samples of uh, memory for a long acquisition. Um, so, how should we do this? You put a probe on this. These are a great starter scope. I mean, out to 500 megahertz, megahertz, you can get rid of the um, get live without um, some of the decoding, serial decoding. Um, this scope is as good as any, and for the bench, yeah, and for the bench. So what I've done is I've hooked up. Uh, quick Start 8 board, which is a demo board for the 7000 series on TDS's, and we'll do an um, auto set on it. And we have a regular square wave here. It's we can do a measurement on it. Let's see. Let's do frequency. So you can see it's not a particularly fast measurement, and you can see the um, waveforms wiggling there a little bit and. It's this class of scope, any of them, whether it's an Agilent scope or a, um, a LaCroix or Tektronix of this era without fast acquisition mode is probably acquiring around 150 waveforms per second. Of course, your eye can't perceive that. Um, your eye, you know, like we go to movies and we watch 30 frames per second, that kind of thing. Same thing's going on in the scope, so they end up um, having to put waveforms on top of waveforms, but typical sampling or update rate on the screen would be about 150 waveforms per second or the equivalent. Some scopes are far less, you know, 100. Others will be up to 200. But um, that that's about the, the limit of it. And so you get a, a square wave like this that's on your screen. It looks fantastic. You think there's no issues with it. Then Tech came along and they said, hey, there's a lot of dead time. You know, I mean, if we're only catching, capturing this square wave 200 times, times you know, 200 times times however many waveforms are on your screen, you know, say three and a half, um, you're not seeing too many itinerations of 182,000 kilohertz per second. So they came out with InstaView, which I just activated. InstaView turns on. Let's see if there's a problem. My glitch thing doesn't always do this glitching, but we'll see. Try a different glitch. Well, no, let's leave it there. Anything gonna happen? Should have tested the glitch before I did anything. 
So okay, so we got glitching going on there. So let me let me turn that off. So the same spewel again, only this time you see all the waveform activity going on there. 318 kilohertz, yeah, but the waveform itself looks okay. And since we're only updating at say 200 times per second max right now. 200 times the number of waveforms you see on the screen is about how many you're actually seeing per second out of 318,000 iterations. So we're missing a fantastic amount of the waveform that's occurring before our eyes right now. We're hardly seeing anything that's going on, but you might be thinking, okay, I'm going to test my power supply here or what have you. Everything looks kosher. Okay, let's go on to the next connection point to see why it is our system crashes, crashes after 15 minutes. Then some guy from tech comes up with this scope and he says, give this one a try. And is anything going to happen? Catch any glitches? Oh crap, there's something wrong with our circuit. And so that was the big selling point of this and the other manufacturers were then in a real pickle. Um, LaCroix, LaCroix and Agilent didn't have anything. LaCroix immediately came out with something that kind of looked like it was doing this, but you had to know what the glitch was to trigger on. And once you know what the glitch is, then the then it's not really a problem anymore because if you know what the glitch is, you can always trigger on it. You can figure out what, what, you, what your trigger parameters have to be to trigger on it, so then it's not a mystery. And these scopes are sampling fast enough where um, they can actually dr accurately draw whatever they see. You know, you know, this isn't undersampling right now, it's oversampling, so it, it can see the waveform. And what this is doing is, tech claim 400,000 times per second, it's updating a waveform database on screen, and any anomalies that's captured in one of those 400,000 acquisitions just shows up on the screen as an infrequent event. Um, so, the scope is constantly acquiring waveforms, constantly displaying them. It's a circular database thing, always writing, always reading, never really stopping. Although there are holes in it. I don't know if you can really believe tech with 400,000 waveforms per second. I think it's a marketing thing by the by the much later 754Ds, for example. I think they were talking about 200 waveforms a second, or 200,000 waveforms a second, not 400,000 like this one. So it's not likely that they went backwards in performance. So I'm not sure where that came from. There might be a, some sort of reasonable explanation. But that's one of the important things about comparing scopes that can do fast acquisition is um, you really have to sit them next to each other and see how they're doing because so much of it is marketing terms. I mean, are they actually acquiring 400,000 waveforms or are they going, or are they shooting each waveform that they capture to a, to a fast um, template to see if it matches the template. If it doesn't, then it gets stored. and do they count all of the misses as acquisitions? I mean, those are totally marketing things that are happening under the hood, and you really have no way of knowing what that true acquisition rate is. All you know is one scope will pick up the problem faster than the other. But for the hobbyist, this thing is as fast as anything you're going to get on a hobby budget new. It's you know it's probably much faster, in fact. So um, this scope is definitely something to consider. Um, the 700s our derivative of the 500s. It's a color screen. This is a much different design from the earlier TDS 500s and the 500As. Um, the earlier scopes had a huge problem with their capacitors. The electrolytic capacitors on all of the boards were just terrible when they were put in. They're all defective. You're a fool to even turn your scope on unless you've verified that they've been replaced or you're in the process of replacing them. You never want to turn them on with the old caps. But when the 700As came out and the 500Bs came out, they were a new design. They'd done away with the capacitors, the electrolytics completely on the acquisition board. And gradually, later on, they got rid of the capacitors on the other scopes. And the thing is, is with the early scopes and the capacitor problem, it was leaking out electrolytics. Some things were shorting. Little, um, you know, data lines were getting burnt out and it's unpredictable. You don't know where the failure is going to be. You just have to troubleshoot the whole scope. Recently, there's schematics that came out for the 500s and the 500As. They're on eBay. Arc Media has them. Um, they want like 25 bucks. Um, they're, of course, they've already hit the internet too as files that you can just simply download. Um, I don't know how that works. I mean, I'm sure Tech never released that manual to the public domain, but um, but the copy might may have ran out on it. I'm not sure how those things work. 
you know, Simshark Media doesn't want you to copy their work, but it's not really their work, so. So, on later scopes like this one, this scope would be equivalent to uh, the acquisition board is the same one that's in a 540B. Um, the, um, this scope is um, pretty much the same as a 754A. I'm not sure what the difference is. The 754C will transition from InstaView to non insta view faster than what this one will. See now we have that nice looking square wave again. Um, if you had a 754D you would um, the transition would be almost instantaneous and you'd be wondering what's wrong with the 744A. Well that's really about the difference in what you're paying for. Um, now the 754D, for example, probably had applications that you couldn't get on the 744A. I mean, it did for sure, and it had a 2M memory option. Same amount of memory, I think, on all the boards, but but it had a 2M memory option. Uh, all the later boards, anyway. So, but aside from that, um, most most of the like application software that you can get for these, I mean, probably isn't it isn't something you'd want to use. You just want to use the oscilloscope part as a hobbyist, and these scopes are in that regard um, as far as an oscilloscope that goes out to 500 megahertz as an oscilloscope these are excellent scopes any of them things that go wrong with these um, the um, on the earlier scopes uh, the ones that aren't like this the old architecture with the crappier um, capacitors the attenuators almost never failed on those but on this family scope and later, it's always the attenuator if there's an acquisition problem, unless there's been physical damage to the board. It's always, virtually always going to be the attenuator if there's an acquisition issue. The display will get tired. It can get bubbling on, on the screen. That uh, is the index matching gel back there is failing. Pretty much have to replace the display. I've heard of people taking them apart and cleaning them, but it's really hard to take those things apart. I've done it before. Um, the um, driver, very often if it's dark, it's probably the CRT, but it can be the driver board that fails as well. Sometimes they'll start making a buzzing noise, um, and that'll be an issue for you. What else? Power supplies die on them sometimes. Sometimes you get lucky and the power supply died when the thing was young, so you fix the power supply or swap out a new power supply, and you're doing well. I would think that 744, you should, should be able to get for you know well under 750 probably four or five hundred maybe as a fixer upper if you find the the um, attenuator that's gone bad on these the attenuators look like that and they're a little they're a little um ceramic um pc board and they shatter if the scope gets dropped hard enough the other thing that fails on them is, is let's see if we can do this. The, the solder at the feet will sometimes fail. You can't see it, you can't tell, but you can um, you can take a soldering iron and you just reheat it and it works fine. Um, let's see. I have a print here somewhere that Give you some ideas on the attenuators. Done a little research over the years. So there's your attenuator. That this is your cheat sheet that tell you how to kind of troubleshoot and zero in on stuff. You know, if you want to know which is your your um, 50 mega ohm, one one mega ohm attenuator thing. You know, relay for it rather. It distract us. Think about something I forgot to mention earlier. Um, so and then you see at the very top on the left here, I'm telling you that if you get an error log thing that says X failed at, you know, I forget, you'll, you'll recognize if you have the problem, X failed at B001 type errors, the X is 0 is channel 1, 1 is channel, how does that work, 1 is channel 2, and 3 and so forth, and that can save you hours in trying to fix this thing. Um, you know, so a little something that will help you figure out where your problem is on these things. Um, I also worked, I, I will never have time to do this, so so I, I worked on this little project kind of, I didn't, didn't ever test it. Forget the photo tips, that's ridiculous. But anyway, the deoxid repair on a relay. I took, um, 
This is a busted attenuator that I soldered just together so it was still one piece. But I took one of the relays apart. Oh, I got the freaking shakes this morning. So, and I figured out that if you stick a straight pin, you know, right there on each of these relays, you turn this one over, right there, if you take a, if you stick a straight pin that looks like this, right there on the relay, and you know, just, you know, what you use to put pictures on the wall or whatever, you could take a bottle of, can I reach it? of the oxid, this stuff, squirt it in there, and who knows, if the relay is failing, you know, like frequency, especially when you're calibrating, a lot of times you can see that, you know, it's, it's failing at 500 megahertz at the 1 millivolt setting or something, or probably 10 millivolt, not, not 1, but, um, you know, you might be able to, you know, if it works, let me know, and we'll, we'll tell the world, and everybody will be able to fix that problem, but, the, but the, the relays are the main problem on these scopes, sometimes the power supplies die, uh, if you swap a new relay in, um, as a hobbyist, you'll, you probably can't tell, even though your calibration is long, no longer kosher, the scope won't know that. Um, if the new relay, you know, passes SPC, which generally that's where you're failing, where your problem is, where you suspect you have a problem is your SPC's failing, you can, um, you know, if you swap a new relay in, and it, or not relay, if you swap a new attenuator in, the scope, you won't be able to tell if it passes SPC. You won't even be able to tell if there's a signal difference or you can calibrate it. I did a couple of videos on that, what you can do, and I think that software is kind of getting out there. So anyway, um, a TDS 744A, um, a pretty good scope. The tech makes active probes for these, of course. They used to. They're still widely available on eBay. They're risky. You want to have a right of return or don't pay too much for them, but this thing will use an active probe. You can get a decent active probe for under 150 bucks, and if you need that, not all hobbyists do, but if you need that, that's pretty sweet. You know, I mean, you can get one of the the newer agile type scopes or tech type scopes, or I should guess it's key sight scopes, or or um, would be another Lacroix. And um, I mean, if you buy an entry level scope from them, the active probe might be as expensive as a scope if there's even one available for it. So, so this can be a uh, a great low cost machine out to 500 megahertz. It has one mega ohm termination at the inputs. Um, it'll do um, 50 ohm. It'll. It's just an all around. You know, this was a performance scope back in 1995, but the design in many ways remained unchanged in through to, until 2000 when they started going to the Windows based scopes. But I, I bet that you could take a TDS 3000. Well, no, you can not can. I, mean, I bet you can take a DPO or MSO 3000 or, a, you know, some of the Keysight scopes even, and the scope for the hobbyist is going to capture those glitches as fast as um, the other guys are. They may not, this thing may not be literally as fast as those scopes, but um, for the hobbyist, um, this thing will do just fine. And that the, the 700 Ds of this, they, um, their displays are really fantastic. I mean, the waveform activity really jumped up. I don't, I, I don't know, maybe a software thing, but um. So we um. I close my book. There's probably some other things I could show someone. Since I don't really work on these all that much anymore. Um, these scopes, you you can, you know, you, there's some information on um. The acquisition boards on these are reconfigurable. I mean, like I say, this, this scope will work just fine on a um, 540B scope. The acquisition board will do just fine. If you took an acquisition board out of 540B, you could stick it in here. You change two resistors, which this pay, this book just um, clued you in on. Then now the scope thinks it's a 7, like on this one it'd be a 784. And a 784, it will have a little more bandwidth than this scope currently has, but once you get out past 600 megahertz or probably 550 megahertz, you're probably going to have to calibrate the scope to 784D. And although your attenuators are all um, 1 gigahertz attenuators, they're all identical. These these will work on all the different scopes, so will the power supplies. 
I'm, I'm talking about the 500 B's and later the 700 A's, the non 700 A, all of those and later and the 600 B's and later the power supplies, relays, everything is all interchangeable you know so um, I don't think a black and white display will work out too well but I think you'll get a trace. I don't recall I did it once but I can't remember what the outcome was um, but um, the issue you can run into in converting one of these to like a 784 is that the, the, even though all of the um, attenuators are 1 gigahertz rated not all of them can be calibrated out that far and, and it probably has to do with age who knows maybe if you do the deoxic thing let me know if the deoxic thing works you know at least do me the honor of sticking it up posting it a reply that it works out of curiosity for me so um so let's get back to my cheat sheet the necrom scopes let's see um so I showed you that page. These do have a console port on them. That you, there's information on the tech uh, user forum about doing the console port thing. I actually have one here. Let me dig it out for you. Give me a second. Shows you how much I use it. This is a genuine Tektronics console port right here. Genuine. Made by Tektronics for Tektronics scopes. I replaced the capacitors. It was the earlier type capacitors. That's how I replaced the capacitors, by the way. I don't use the SMDs. And this worked great on the Tech scopes. And this plugs into the console port on the board. Now the board is is talking to you. When you have this plugged in, the scope's talking to you. You're doing, you know, you're doing SPC and a channel's failing. It's saying, hey, channel two isn't doing its duty or something. SPC information. Keep in mind that the signal path compensation is affecting all channels at the same time. So a bad attenuator can cause all of your. Um, all of your, all or some of your different attenuators to appear to be bad. So sometimes you replace, for example, channel two, and magically everything's all good. So, and a good attenuator is probably worth a hundred bucks on eBay, I would think. But it, the trick is most sellers don't have the slightest what they're selling, so they don't really know. Um, uh, adjusting your color display to get a more life, a little bit of life out of it. We got something like. I can't get it all on screen. Something's got to move. Adjusting your color display. Um, the caution here is you adjust that thing one time, it just killed the display out lot right on me, so I don't touch that one anymore. Um, brightness, this is a brightness control, but many of these controls you shouldn't really be adjusting all that much. I mean, you, you risk your thing just simply dying on you. Um, you can look at that if you want. I'm not sure that I really use that information. Sometimes I was just figuring stuff out and then at future time I found a better way, you know, so it wasn't necessarily a something that that you would want to do, but you can try to read this on your screen. I think this is going to be filmed in fairly high resolution. So you might be able to read it. I don't know. Something about early firmware on the right. A couple of years ago, there's no way I would have shown anyone this stuff, but I've got like two cases of these displays. Sooner or later, I'll have to sell them. They're kind of gold, but you know, I, don't, I don't really care for working on these scopes all that much anymore. Work on some newer stuff though. But even that, I'm getting lazy with. So when it all oh, on scopes, um. Like with this scope, you're going to find some of those electrolytic capacitors on some of the other boards, your um, communications option in the back. Um, you can optionally replace them. I haven't seen that there's a real problem with them, but I used to always replace them. Um, I was the guy who posted actually on the tech forum that you could just simply wiggle the um, capacitor, surface mount capacitors off rather than just soldering them. Some boards with capacitors on the earlier scopes were really crappy boards, you know, I mean 
the what you saw on the pads of the surface mount electrolytic capacitors could be anywhere from something look brand new to black and crusty and the dirtier and nastier the pads looked the more likely this the um the trace the circuit trace on the board was going to lift when you remove the capacitor so i tried you know low temperature desoldering methods i tried hot air um i tried um tweezers hot tweezers and this is the way to do it is you you stick it down on the the um, capacitor and you go from pole to pole you roll pushing down pull to pull not this but pull to pull there's a guy on, e on um, not eBay on um, YouTube that says to do it like this um, all I can say is I've done more than 2,000 capacitors this way so um, and um, check this tool out I needed I had another I was using this but it just didn't do a very good job of grabbing the capacitor so I needed to find something like this um, surplus from Tektronix <laughs> yeah well you know so maybe I wasn't the first guy to figure that out after all um, so anyway um, I'm doing a lot of ums so I think I'm coming to an end of this the, the scope itself does everything you would expect scope to do now we're just a regular oscilloscope I think in fast acquisition mode this is doing like 500 screenshots this has 500 points is what the screen is um, this thing let's see if I can oh, how do I do it? acquire menus over here oh it's still an install So, you know, we can switch it to dots, you know, seeing actual, actual samples, infinite persistence, you know, if you've got a scope that doesn't have fast acquisition, this is what you're left with to find glitches. And on this particular glitch, it's three to five minutes typical on this class of a scope. Um, if you're... Oh, what do I have on here? Oh, this is it. If you got one of these things, a new thing from Tech. Um, this thing could take you an hour or hours to find a glitch. I'm not kidding. It's really ridiculous. So that thing's a big step back in technology um, as far as fast acquisition. But it's a teaching scope. You know, we'll give them that. So, um, you know, what is so we can switch apparently to InstaD right there too. This thing has 500 megahertz bandwidth. Um, uh, in interleave, so um, if you got one channel going, you can have up to two giga samples per second. Forget what it's saying up here. This isn't the correct bezel on this thing. So um, let's see. I don't think I'll, I'll apply a signal, but um, I'll transition out of it. You know. So we got one signal going here. So it does tell me sample, right? So sample rate is on the upper left of the screen. So it's showing two giga samples right now. So that's how fast it's sampling that. I'll change the drop this down a little bit. It's in infinite persistence. So I'll start. Let's get it going again. Okay. So um, now if I turn on a second channel, which I just did. Oh, okay. Because it's doing that. It's in the um, what do they call that ET thing? It's um got to do acquire repetitive turn repetitive signal analysis off okay so now and actually let's just let's turn off um, how did I do infinite persistence how did I get rid of it well anyway with two channels running you see that our, our sampling rate has changed to one Giga samples per second. Now I'm not sure if three if it'll stay at I'm not sure if with three channels will it stay at um one. No, it goes to five hundred. So on this one, um one channel run you can have out to two um two giga samples per second. Two channels running you have uh, any two channels running you get um one giga sample per second is your fastest sampling rate and then um 
beyond that any three or more it's going to be 500 mega samples per second so uh, what do we have um, save and re oh set up that's what I want recall factory set up thank you I don't work with this scope much anymore this thing's more nostalgia than anything Come on, didn't I tell it? Oh, sorry about that. This thing again is a lot slower in, in screen transitions than what you would see in like a um, 754D if you were going to get one of those instead. So, so if I push a button it doesn't do anything and I just sit there, it's because I'm not expecting it necessarily to do anything. So, um, so we can take this guy and turn on a signal generator. This isn't going to work. I'm going to have to drag the signal generator closer, unfortunately. So, all set. I need to change the signal generator. What happened? Oh, I don't have it sent doing that signal thing. Try that. Auto set. There we are, but I want to do acquire. I want to turn repetitive off. So okay, so repetitive. It's not doing. It's um, stuff on chip. You know, this this these are just samples. So I think I can do single shot. Um, how do I do a single shot on this scope? I think I adjust it here. So single shot, two gig samples because it's using all of them. Um, what happens if I bump the signal up to 200 megahertz? Ooh, we start to lose some bandwidth fast, don't we? But now if I turn repetitive signal back on, see what happens there. The time is on, single shot. Let's see what our amplitude is. This so you see it's kind of putting it back together. Turn our repetitive off. A little more real time because it's not doing as much. It's not doing as much um you know internal magic to these things to the signal figure using repetitive waveform with them this thing you know repetitive waveform it's not actually doing a sample um, what would it be if it's one gig sample it'd be doing a sample every um, nanosecond and if it's two it'd be a half a nanosecond but um this thing it's doing random repetitive sampling so it you know so it's using two clocks to to get to sample in between the spaces as well total of two giga samples and so um, on this scope if we go if I set the generator to 10 megahertz bring this back to 10 just uh, 10 megahertz bring it back to 10 okay so measure let's do um, we could have done rise time, but let's do one of the RMS values. RMS, then let's go back to the first page and let's do frequency. So we can see that I got a 10 megahertz signal. Is this thing turn okay, termination's wrong for the signal generator. That's may have affected some of our look earlier. We want 50 ohm. Okay, so now we have a signal that is look good. Got a signal that's a little bit under this signal generator is not heated up yet amplitude bump the amplitude up to show 100 millivolts or right about there so our 3 dB cutoff point for bandwidth would be 70.7 so let's start let's start bumping our um, frequency up let's go to 100 megahertz first so I'll change scale just to keep it on screen nice 
70, 80, 90, 100 megahertz. Now I'm going to take steps and um, I'm doing this with the control. Now I'm going to take steps and um, 100 megahertz. And so we're watching for our 70.7 cutoff point. So I'm at 600 megahertz right now. So this thing easily exceeds. I'm stepping by tens. Oh, right there. So that's pretty close to 610 is my fre actual frequency that the generator is putting out. So that's a bandwidth on this. Um, if I turn where things get a little funky on these is if I go back to the acquire menu say so real time only so now if I turn a second channel on it starts having some serious problems because it's not sampling as fast and it's having a little more difficulty um, it's having a little more difficulty um, picking it up let's look at our trigger menu make sure that yeah, it's still on channel 1. Let's see, uh, set to 50%. So that really screws things up. So they're not completely infallible. But again, if I was to go back to my choir menu, I'm not really looking for glitches here. I'm just looking at what's, what's going on for the most part. And so if I turn on enable, so there it's able to figure it out. So real time, you're you're taking a lot away a lot of the magic of the in, interior of the scope, and it's just raw sampling power, and it's not it's not figuring things out so much. But if you start adding channels to it, channel three, we've added to it, it still is able to resolve what you know the frequency, and you still have your bandwidth. So, so these are pretty cool scopes, actually. They're a good scope for the hobbyists, you know prices on these things on, on eBay you know I mean it's always upside down I mean you know I, uh, you know I, I see what I would think are deals all the time for three four five six hundred dollars um, but you may have to replace an attenuator these attenuators are the the Achilles heels of these um, you can get displays you can put else I've done plenty of LCD displays right 640 by 480 display in there and use the VJ connect from the back and route it inside to the display and use a buck converter 24 volts DC that the, the scope has to 12 volts DC um, if you roll your own it might be kind of noisy so you may want to buy one from China as much as I hate to buy stuff from China like that but um, they're actually better than the homebrew ones I did where I was putting minimal in effort into them but um, um, so Display issues can be a problem. Attenuator, you may have to swap out an attenuator. You know, you have to get the person. What you got to do with these to test them is, is for example, vertical menu. Um, when I, I have a 50 ohm signal coming in, not working at all. Let me see this. Let me go back to 10 megahertz. So let's turn these other channels off. Oops, didn't do two. Well, maybe I did. Just was slow. So if I go one mega home, yeah, that's telling you your relay is working. You know, you're getting about twice the amplitude when you're in one mega ohm versus 50 ohm, which is, you know, is a lot more of a, a lot more current can flow through 50 ohm. So so that's going on there. What about a AC? Well, this this isn't a very good scope or signal to try that on since it's an AC signal. But um, you know, if you had a DC, you know, it's a signal generator, so you know, there's going to be virtually no AC offset. But if you had a signal that was up like that, and you press the AC button, you'd expect it would center on the screen. That's telling you a relay is doing its duty. And then ground. That's what you kind of want to see. So you want to do that with all the channels of a new scope that you get in. You also want to run the SPC, which I won't do now because that'll take a long time. But um, but it's um, shift, utility, and then you got your system controls. And um, we go down here. You compensate signal path. It should pretty much compensate and pass, show pass here every single time, or rather, I was blocking the screen there every single time. Um, 
you'll have also an error log you look in your error log and um, see how there's nothing in that black square I've had people accuse me that they I wasn't showing the error that is the error log right there there's nothing written in there saying blah 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 um, floppy drive fails no big deal you get a disk cleaner kit and I have one of those right here I use them all the time Oops. that's a disk cleaning kit you stick the disk in there put some of that juice on the disk itself run it a few times and um, magically the floppy drive starts working but if there's mass storage errors that's your floppy drive that's all who cares if you're plugging in an active probe and you're kind of screwing with it and you're, you're just not getting it right um, you'll get some error probe errors who cares you know you just clear the error log there's plenty of information out there about the error log and how to deal with it so you'll send the error, error log clear command it's something like that error log clear I think with your gpib um, and then of course the scope should be able to get through all of the um, diag error that should probably sitting right there it should be able to get through you know all of the um, self tests which you would just run like that but I won't waste your time with that so anyway you check your your attenuators on each channel make sure that you have a ground a AC and so forth